Good afternoon. Don't make the mistake, this is a sad and yet at the same time glorious day. So on behalf of the family of Diane and RJ and Elizabeth, we want to thank you for coming and thank you for those who are watching online. My name is Matt Given. I'm a local pastor. I first met Bob at the other end of this building at the Tuesday morning men's breakfast at 6 a.m. every Tuesday morning. Now the food was pretty good, but if you're getting up at 6 a.m. in the middle of winter to attend a men's breakfast, you're probably not coming for the food. I think Bob came because he enjoyed digging into God's word and he enjoyed fellowshipping with other men. And that alone is a testimony to Bob. I was honored last year when he contacted me and told me about his diagnosis and asked if I would walk with him in some form or fashion. I was honored to be asked. And occasionally I would drop by with a Panera food and some Panera food or a visit, a visit to the hospital, standing outside and talking. But I was honored when he asked me to walk with him. We prayed a lot for Bob at Deep Rivers Church. We prayed for him on a Saturday night. We prayed for him on a Sunday morning. We didn't pray for him by name because he wanted us to respect his privacy. But now I let you know, one time I slipped. After we prayed, I said something, and I mentioned Bob by name. We prayed big things for Bob. We prayed for miraculous things for Bob. We did it unabashedly, unashamedly, because we really do believe that God is honored in the asking. And the bigger the ask, I think the more honor you show God. Last Wednesday night at our prayer house meeting, we prayed for Bob again. And I sent Diane a text on Thursday morning saying, we prayed for Bob last night at prayer house. And she replied back that with a conversation that I asked RJ about, he said I could share. And you might have heard that in those last days, Bob said he saw angels and a desire to walk on the glorious ground. I said, this is a sad and still yet glorious thing. I thought, what a gift. What a gift that our good God gave to Bob and to all of us. We still have the opportunity to honor God today. We're here to celebrate Bob's life. We're here to remember Bob's life. We're here to honor a life well lived.
Thanks to everyone for coming. For those of you I haven't met, I'm Bob's daughter, Elizabeth. Some people call me Liz. My dad called me Liz Pooh. I'm joined today by my husband, who has been my rock through this roller coaster. Thank you so much, Luke. I love you so much. I also really need to thank my amazing family and friends for being so supportive thus far. You have already helped more than you know. This is most certainly not how we imagined my dad leaving this world. We will miss him greatly. A big part of getting through this is doing it together. Thank you all for being here and being part of that first step of togetherness, physically and virtually. I also really appreciate the tributes and outreaches sent to me and posted on social media. I knew my dad was a great surgeon and leader. Reading specific examples helped me understand that even more and make us smile. Thank you. My dad asked me to read something meaningful from Psalm 73 today as part of my reflection on his life. For those that know me and my dad knew the best, knew me the best of all people on earth, it should not surprise you that I thoroughly diligence this psalm. What are the key points which meant the most to my dad and why? It didn't take me long to realize this exercise that he gave me was an intentional, thoughtful gift. <laughs> the gift of taking time to meditate and think through application of a very important worldview lens of his. With an eternal perspective, everything looks different. For today's occasion, I have chosen to read Psalm 73, verses 21 through 26. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? The earth has nothing I desire besides you. My, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. <laughs> These last two verses really capture my dad's eternal perspective on our existence and chief end. My dad had evolving frameworks for his worldview since as long as I can remember, which verses meant the most, what they meant to him. But since around the age of 60, only seven years ago, he continued to hearken back to the same six tenets of life, love, devotion to Christ, prayer, joy, thanksgiving, and contentedness. First John, second Corinthians, first Thessalonians, and Philippians contain key verses about each of these key tenets that he would often reference. And I'm happy to share any of those with you after the service. While this is an agonizing, gutting diagnosis, we were blessed with the time to sort of plan and strategize how to best prepare for my dad's existential departure. Planning and strategizing were things my dad and I really loved to do together. One very special thing we did together was design a piece of jewelry for my daughter, Sophia, his first and only grandchild, to encapsulate those tenets, love, devotion to Christ, prayer, joy, thanksgiving, and contentedness. <laughs> this was one of the last design projects we truly worked on together. We completely nerded out. <laughs> Leveraging systems engineering principles to think through each of the elements, the jewels, and their interfaces, mostly metals, to optimize both form and function. Right, Dad? Yeah. I'm sharing my dad's in my last project, not only because it's beautiful, but also it is an example of the special relationship I had with my dad, for which I'd like to share a couple common quotes from my mom, Diane. That's exactly what your father said. <laughs> you and your dad just get each other. You guys said the same thing at the same time. <laughs> As we were preparing for this service, we started writing speeches as well as pulling together a memorial table, which you saw out there. To get started on both, I asked myself, what special thing did Dad and I do together? Sure, we went running and we traveled and we ate great meals, but I realized and sort of always knew, just didn't have an impetus to articulate it. With you, Dad, it wasn't about what we did. It was about how you and I did it that I loved and cherished so much. 
We planned, we strategized, we thoughtfully course corrected for everything. My dad did this for all of our trips before Google, even before MapQuest. <sighs> and throughout all of this, growing our understanding of whatever we were talking about was fun. From birds, to world history, to general plumbing, to hymnody, and much more. I was usually the one doing the learning, but I like to think I taught my dad a couple of things along the way too. A common mantra of mine that my dad especially appreciated was, let's discuss the what, not the how. <laughs> dad and I think, dad, sorry, dad, I will think differently about this phrase now. The how may not change the end result, but it can greatly impact those involved in getting to the end result. The tributes I've read over the last couple of days have really enforced that perspective. So daddy, I'm still learning from you. I have one final piece to leave the group with. I'm sure it's no surprise, but along with Bob's thoughts, which you guys can find in your program about each of the hymns we're listening to, chosen by him, he also wrote a version of his eulogy, which I'd like to read for you now. A brief bio of Robert E. Sillery, Silly, covering the domains of belief, family origin, current family, career, and hope. I am not a naturalist. I don't believe that the universe is all there ever was and all there ever will be. I am a transcendent. I believe that reality includes more than time, space, and matter. Believing either requires an act of faith. An eternal cycle of universes is too big a leap of faith for me. I would rather find a first cause, perhaps an eternal, powerful, disembodied mind. I have carefully chosen my story, recognizing it also it is also an act of faith, but it does make sense to me and provides the underpinning and rationale for a life of self-sacrificial service. That is the life I wish I had lived. I tried. My family loved me dearly and instilled values of hard work, excellence, and sacrifice in me. They were by no means perfect, but I never wondered if I was loved. They instilled in me and my siblings a love of words and science that served us well. I tried to be an athlete, but hadn't much talent. Lots of will, lots of practice, not much to show for it. It did, however, provide the background for staying fit through my life. Exercise, particularly running, was of great comfort during treatment for pancreatic cancer while I was able. I have been blessed with an excellent wife and amazing children who are loved not for what they do, but for who they are. Diane has provided insight in my life and loved me through all the hard and easy times. I love them deeply. They will survive without me. They will thrive without me. Here's a planned career story. High school science guy, college chemistry major, medical school with a resume that secured first-rate surgical training, narrowed the field to pediatric surgery, dedicated to an academic job for 30 years, the end. Seriously, it has been an honor to serve patients and providers. It has been an honor to serve patients and providers alike help educate the next generation of surgeons, make some small contributions to this body of scientific knowledge, and provide leadership while I was able. Now my story is over. Please enjoy, laugh and cry these next few minutes. Grieve if you must. Celebrate a life well lived if you care to. Perhaps get to know me a little better in my death than you did in my life. Leave this place with my blessing, hoping for an even better tomorrow. We'll now hear from Mahalia Jackson singing a song my dad used to sing on the way to work, listen to on the way to work, A Closer Walk.
everybody. One of the blessings of this past year after my dad's diagnosis is that we were able to be very intentional with everything we did, from conversations about life to recording his memories to planning this funeral. Liz and Mom, you did a great job, and it was great to get input from my father. My father, knowing that I was speaking, asked me, RJ, are you going to be able to hold it together up there? He was referring to the super sensitive side that I have. I told him I make no promises. But I reminded him that this super sensitive side comes from the silly genes, as my grandmother couldn't make it through a hymn or a goodbye without tearing up. I will do my best up here, but know these are tears of joy. My dad and I were very close. I referred to him as Superman, although he joked in the last year and said that Superman himself is mere mortal. When I was younger, we bonded over spending time together, sports, and just enjoying each other's company. Our bond entered into a new phase when I went to college and asked if he could proofread a paper. Spoiler alert, he did more than proofread. <laughs> the class was centered around a book called The Hero's Journey. The Hero's Journey is the description of a character in a movie and the journey they take. There are 12 steps, I won't bore you with all of them, but some of the steps are the call to action, the test, the reward, and the ultimate reward. The assignment was the app to map out Tupac Shakur's journey, and also journey in the movie Juice. I didn't pick the topic. My dad and I enjoyed this assignment. It was more than comical to hear Bob's thoughts on Tupac's call to action and his ultimate reward. But for this speech, with my dad as the subject, I'm going to lay out the hero, his hero's journey. For my dad here's journey, we start with a call to action. Bob Silly was born in 1955 in Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. Son of John and Dorothy, brother to John and Althea. My dad as a young child was adventurous, loved to play, loved to read, loved to learn, and was a super caring guy. I asked my dad what he wanted to do when he grew up, and he responded, RJ, I was put on this earth to serve. Most importantly, he wanted to serve the Lord in everything that he did. He took great pride in being a man of God and spreading his message. His desire to serve and work with children led him to be wanting to be a pediatric surgeon from a very young age. My dad also wanted to serve in many other ways, serving his wife, his kids, the resident community, and just serve as many possible ways as he could. It's safe to say that this part of the hero's journey, the call to action, my dad's action was to serve. The next part of the hero's journey is the test. My dad's ultimate test in life was his journey to becoming a doctor. From medical school to residency, he described those years as a battle. Working 100 hours plus weeks, not sleeping for three to four days straight, maybe crashing a car when he fell asleep at the wheel, and always trying to figure out if he was quote unquote good enough. While battling, he met his beautiful and caring wife, they managed a long distance relationship, he started and raised a family, continued to serve the Lord, and tried to balance many things. Balancing all of this was the ultimate test. <laughs> After the test in the hero's journey comes the reward. Spending time with his family was my dad's greatest joy. Mom, you and dad were two peas in a pod, being there for each other, watching football, sitting by the pool, gardening, going on hikes, and just enjoying each other's presence. You were his rock, and I admire how he looked to you for guidance every step of the way. Liz, he loved how you finished each other's sentences. He loved seeing his little girl grow up. You made him laugh, but you also challenged each other. From you finding a loophole when you were one year old by him saying, don't touch the trash can, but you pulled a piece of paper out of the middle of the trash can and technically didn't touch the trash can. <laughs> to now being older, discussing hospital system design to worldviews, he appreciated you in every way possible. <laughs> to all the family in the room, Bob loved each and every one of you, and he prayed for you. My dad had seven different prayers for the seven days of the week, and on day five, he prayed for extended family. My dad and I had a special bond. We had the ability to talk for hours. We loved to talk sports, especially at the dinner table. Sorry, Liz and Mom. I truly cherished every moment with him, and even prior to his diagnosis, I didn't take the time for granted. We spent many summers in Michigan, and in 2008, we started the annual boys' trip to the cottage. We spent weeks planning and talking about it. Nothing got in the way of the trip. 
Even an invitation to play Pine Valley, for all of you golfers out there, I turned down an invitation to play Pine Valley to go to the cottage with my dad. Good thing that I didn't, because thankfully, or thankfully, and I didn't know at the time, that that would be our last trip to Michigan. We spent our time walking the beach, fixing something, hanging out, napping, playing golf, which he continuously reminded me that if he started practicing, he could hang with the guys at his age. He, pr he was actually pretty good for only playing one round a year. We loved to run together. By my math, we ran over 1,000 miles and close to 100 miles after his diagnosis while battling chemotherapy. Each week, we would send each other our times, our distances, always encouraging each other and being impressed by one another. I have two stories that I want to share, both fun, fun memories of my dad and our relationship. My dad always wanted us to go to Christian school, which I did for elementary. However, with my friends being in public school, mom started to make the push. Mom won this battle. Thank you, Mom. And I started going to Hershey Middle School. My first assignment was from Mrs. Bates. Our assignment was to watch a TV show and plot the different parts of the story. Not pretty similar to the hero's journey. Protagonist, antagonist, beginning, middle, and end. The class picked the show Home Improvement. I told my dad that my homework assignment for the night was to watch TV. He rolled his eyes about my first public school uh, homework assignment in the public school system. He decided to watch it with me. The episode was centered around Tim the Toolman Taylor being upset that his boys didn't want to show him affection in public anymore. He missed the hugs and the I love yous. Tim got advice from his trusted neighbor, Al Borland, who my dad always got a kick out of and somehow connected Al's advice to scriptural, scriptural and spiritual references, a common theme in my dad's repertoire. Al said, why don't you come up with a code name so your sons don't feel embarrassed? Tim liked the idea and proposed it to the boys. They came up with the phrase as they lived in Detroit, how about them lions? My dad and I really liked that and actually adopt, adopted it into our vocabulary. Being Penn State and the Lion fans, it helped. I was never embarrassed to tell him I loved him, but that phrase had a special meaning to me. Man, what would I give to hear my dad say, how about them lions, one more time? The second story, this is a funny one. I was 15 years old, and I spent a day at the golf course preparing for a tournament the next day. My dad instilled a work ethic in me that I take great pride in and honor by working hard in whatever I do. My dad came home and asked me if I felt prepared for the tournament. I had a really bad day at the golf course, and I told him I didn't feel ready. It was 9 p.m. at night. He probably had a long day. He replied, let's get you ready, which was code for let's go back to the golf course and practice more. We spent many late nights at the golf course where he just loved to watch me golf. As I said before, my dad wasn't much of a golfer, and usually in life I listened to his advice, but on the golf course, I didn't. He was pretty conservative in nature, always telling me to hit the longer club no matter what. Over time, he stopped giving me swing tips and club advice. He stuck to putting advice as the physics of that were much easier to break down. Anyways, we headed over to Parkview, and for any of you Hershey golfers, if you remember the seventh hole, it was lit up by the giant center's lights. You couldn't see the whole hole, but there was enough light that I could put some balls down and hit them. I hit my bag of 15 to 20 balls uh, at the green. We would then go and get them. My dad would ask questions like, did you really not lose any balls in that round? Which his, it was his way of being impressed, but it was also a thing he hated to lose things. I'm in the middle of hitting my third round of balls, and my dad said, RJ, the cops are coming. I said, what? He said, the cops are coming. I turned to see a cop shining a light in my face. The cop starts to ask questions, and of course, as an arrogant 15-year-old, I start giving him lip about stopping the big bad golfer committing a crime. I told him I had permission, and he doesn't need to worry about it. I think that was the case, and that's what I told my dad prior to going to the course. The cop continues to pepper me with questions and ask, well, how do you know where the balls are? If any of you know my dad, he got easily excitable over small things. When we would go to a restaurant and see a drink that he was excited about on the menu, like a raspberry lemonade, non-alcoholic of course, he would get excited. The waiter or waitress would ask them what he wants to drink, and he got this look in his eye, and he would say, oh, I'll have a raspberry lemonade. <laughs> and the waiter or the waitress, they paused. They didn't know if he was being sarcastic, <laughs> condescending, or what just happened. But in reality, it was just my dad being excited about drinking a raspberry lemonade. Well, back to the golf story and the cop asking how I knew where the balls were. I saw the raspberry lemonade look in my dad's eye. And he answers to the cop, 
sir, they're all on the green. And he laughed. My dad was proud and excited, but the cop, the cop pauses for a second, and look, gave the look like the waiter or the waitress, and thought he was being a smart aleck. The cop rolls his eyes, hands our IDs back to us, and walks away without another word. My dad had a big smile on his face after that, and we've told that story many times. I love my dad's smile. He was such a happy and joyful guy. Those stories are fun to tell. Before I finish the hero's journey, I want to acknowledge a few people in the room. Mom, for 40 years, you were his rock. You were there for him every step of the way. This past year, you were his private nurse, spending months at the hospital, months, giving him great care. Until his last day on earth, you slept at his bedside, staying up the entire night, praying, and just being there with the big guy. I'm so glad you didn't listen to me when I said go to bed. You were able to have that special memory. <laughs> Those were tough days. I know how much you shared in the pain. It wasn't easy. You did an amazing job, and thank you for taking such good care of Dad. Liz, always with the plan. From flying tissue to California to organizing calls with doctors, you were always on top of it. You cared so much for him, and it showed in your desire and ability to execute the plan. Marissa and Luke, this wasn't easy. Sacrifices were made, and you were there for every step of the way. Thank you for giving us the joy of spending the last year with our father and being so understanding every single weekend. Bill DeMuth. Bill, he looked forward to running with you each week. He loved running with another man of faith. Thank you for pounding the miles with him and having an everlasting conversation. Jack Myers. I know you're not in the room, but hopefully you're listening. My dad didn't seek out a lot of friendships, but there was something about my dad's smile when, when you reached out. Jack's calling. And his face would light up. Jack, you were a great friend of my dad during this battle. You looked out for him and cared for him. Thank you for your care and persistency. Dr. Hall and Dr. Wolfgang, thank you for your amazing care and everything you did for my dad. He respected you both as doctors and trusted your advice. He knew he was in good hands. We were internally grateful. Everyone in the room, the community in Wachee, you have been so great to us during this difficult time. Thank you for your support and kind words. As we return to the hero's journey, the last stop is the final reward. Most people would say, how is dying from pancreatic cancer the final reward along the journey? My dad lived life knowing that he was on God's time and that God had a plan for him. His entire life, he told me and us, man not know his time. And he would also ask us, how will people remember your legacy? My dad's ultimate reward and legacy were not worldly accomplishments, like being the best pediatric surgeon in the world. His ultimate reward and legacy was that he was a man of faith, a loving husband and father, a servant, someone who spread the word of God, and someone who would enter the gates when his time was called. My dad and I loved walking the beaches of Lake Michigan. On our walks, we would look out to the sunset and say, this is, he would say, this is my little slice of heaven. I know my dad is in a better place, no longer in pain, and doesn't need to settle for a slice of heaven. He's got the whole thing. Pops, big man, and Superman, I'm going to miss you. Stay in shape up there. You owe me a run when I enter. I love you. And how about them lions? Next we, will be listening, next, we will be listening to a song that was chosen by my mother, which is an expression of her love to her beloved husband that she wanted you to hear. So well stated in a song that most of you will recognize. And this is special to us as we used to dance in the kitchen to this song. The song is Perhaps Love by John Denver and Placido Domingo. <laughs>
Okay. A bit about Bob, some recollections and reflections. This is the second time in a year that I'm in front of a group to speak like this. The first was when an older brother-like friend passed away. I'd known him for only 13 years. Now it's because I've lost my brother. I knew him nearly 67 years. The older I've become, the more grateful I've been for those years, especially the recent ones. Bob almost didn't make it out of his first week, but due to the skill of a pediatric surgeon in Philadelphia, he thrived. He had a pyloromyotomy, an operation allowed him to keep his feedings down. After that, he flourished. I asked him once if his experience with surgery as an infant influenced him in deciding on pediatric surgery as a career. He told me it didn't. He was initially drawn to pediatric reconstructive surgery, but decided not to sub subspecialize. Bob was a skillful surgeon who understood the key surgical concept. Surgery is more than being able to just do a procedure. He was an accomplished basic science researcher Bob spent almost his entire career at Hershey Medical Center, finally as professor of surgery, professor of pediatrics, and chief of the children's hospital. His interest in systems engineering as applied to measuring quality helped Bob guide the institution into the top tier of children's hospitals for surgical and trauma care in the nation. Needless to say, I'm extremely proud of my more academically accomplished younger brother. Bob asked me if I wanted to speak at this service. <clears throat> I told him I didn't think it was optional. He also told me to keep it to two minutes. <laughs> it goes over. Liz, the plan are a lot a little longer, so I think I'm okay. Faced with those constraints, I was torn between talking about Bob the professional or Bob the brother. I chose Bob, my brother. My first recollection of Bob after he was born was standing at the corner of Broad and Ontario with our dad, looking up across Broad Street at Temple Hospital while mom waved from her room. The first time I saw Bob, he was on a pillow in a wallpaper covered cardboard box with wooden handles, the kind of handle they used to carry packages tied with string. The box was also used while riding in the car. It's a wonder he or any of us survived. As Bob grew up, he was a kind, thoughtful kid. Bob and selfish didn't appear in the same sentence. He was a good student at Philmont Christian Academy where he was an athlete as well. We often went on a family road trip during the summer, many times dressed in look-alike outfits. On one particular, particular trip when Bob was quite small, probably three or four years old, we were in a Catholic church in Kentucky to which a number of Rembrandt paintings had been relocated for safety during World War II. It was a large Gothic style building. Bob, being a little kid, was reminded that he should be quiet because we were in a church. As we looked around the paintings, there suddenly was loud, achoo. Not a sneeze, but an achoo. Bob was testing the acoustics in the space. <laughs> Just Bob being Bob. We took a big family camping trip through the West when he was seven. He was always excited for whatever the, thing, the next thing was to see. Inquisitive and Bobby Silly were synonymous. He caught it from our dad, it never left him. Having gone off to college when Bob was in junior high school, there were lots of his life I heard about but had little contact with. He sold Fuller Brush door to door one summer during high school. Another summer, he slogged through swamps in Michigan as part of a surveying team for an oil company. About that job, Bob recently told me that he found out that it was possible to walk across Michigan in a straight line. When he was in medical school, I heard about a Temple Hospital nurse he met. <clears throat> Bob and Diane fell in love and eventually married. While at the U of M, they had two children. Bob raised them there. Diane raised him there in almost single mom-like fashion. So such was the life of a surgical resident's family. Bob dearly loved Diane. Her support of him was unwavering through their life and continued steadfastly through his battle with cancer. 
Bob could not have done it without Diane's love and comfort, nor would he have wanted to. They were team silly. <clears throat> we skied together in Colorado where Bob learned so he could ski with his kids. They all loved it. We also snowmobiled. It was something that Bob and I first experienced in Michigan with our parents on a Christmas vacation trip to the cottage. Bob loved sailing his sunfish on Lake Michigan. He collected hymn books and curated a significant collection of rare and ecumenical hymnals. Bob and Diane also collected a variety of types of art. Growing up, I really wasn't aware of his appreciation of art, though perhaps I should have been. Mom and Dad gave Bob a Winslow Homer print when he was 12. It was the starter piece. Bob loved living in Hershey, where Liz and RJ were mostly raised. RJ, having been born in Michigan and lived there for a few years, still has this thing for maize and blue. Go figure, go blue. Bob is more of a we are to the state. Bob would have been completely content to retire to 98 Laurel Ridge, but it wasn't to be. He truly enjoyed being at home. Most importantly, Diane was there. His library and art were there. A few other things important to him were there. In winter, he could see down the hill into the valley through the trees. When the trees were in full leaf in the summer, it was secluded. He loved tending his woods and gardens and only gave them up when chemotherapy-induced neuropathy forced him to. He loved swimming laps and other pleasures he was robbed of by the effects of treatment. He loved to run even if he didn't have to. I don't quite understand that, but apparently it's a thing. <laughs> Despite the neuropathy, he ran a 5K in the fall. You see, after his diagnosis, Bob did everything he normally did until, until the disease and its side effects of treatment prevented him. Bob fiercely loved his little granddaughter, Sophia. He told me early on in the course of his disease that he wasn't afraid to die, just sad that he wouldn't get to see his Sophia grow up and interact with her while she did. I always knew Bob was thoughtful, but he was a really deep thinker, something I only came to realize in the past couple of years. During his illness, he spent considerable time reflecting on philosophical subjects. I doubt this interest was new. He just had more time to devote to it then. Like our dad, Bob was strongly principled, a deeply religious man. Above all, he loved Jesus. Bob was a fighter, and he fought his cancer as he lived his life, driven with purpose and determination. He explored all the options available to him and soldiered on despite overwhelming odds. He endured much with hope and grace, buoyed up by his faith. The hardest part of treating any cancer is knowing when to say, that's enough. Bob decided that's an, for him. Enough was when more was doing to him rather than for him. Having reached that point, Bob did just what I would have expected. He made a plan that included the care necessary to allow him to wrap up loose ends to his satisfaction. Again, Bob being Bob. As a man of great faith, he knew where the real Bob would be after he drew his last breath. Present with the Lord. He's there now. Bob ran the race to the best of his ability, always for the glory of God. We're sad because we have lost a husband, a father, a grandfather, a friend, and my brother. We are comforted by the fact that he's not suffering anymore. Going too soon, little bro, I love you. I will miss you, Bobby. But I know that I will see you again all of a sudden. Thank you, family, for having the courage and the thoughtfulness to share what you have. It's taken a lot, 
I know you've said things on behalf of Diane, and I know she appreciates that a great deal. Um, it's, it, I only had a few occasions to see the family during this time. One was uh, near the, I guess, the second week of January, and to see how they loved each other and how they cared for each other. Um, the relationships that they had, you could just tell they were deep, um, and the love was deep, and uh, you are in our prayers uh, in this time of loss. Um, we have hope, but we do grieve, and uh, we pray for you. My name's Tom Nicholas. Um, I'm Bob's cousin, and uh, my dad and uh, Bob's mom were brother and sister. Uh, we grew up together in Willow Grove, uh, just a few miles apart. Uh, Bob and I went to the same church, we were raised in very similar homes. We attended the same schools, went to the same college. Uh, he was uh, pre-med, so I never saw him at college except during soccer practice. Uh, we played on the same soccer teams, walked the same beach on Lake Michigan where we shared the same cottage. and. He and I, our, our families together, uh, worshiped the same Lord. And we sought, however imperfectly, to live out our faith shaped by God's revelation of himself in the scriptures. Um, I want to read at this time, uh, just as a beginning, uh, that section from Job 19 that we just heard sung. Oh, that my words were recorded and that they were written on a scroll or engraved on a rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the, in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Now, why would Dr. Robert Silly, a dedicated and talented surgeon with a mind as sharp as his scalpel, and knowledge in the realm of science in general and the practice of medicine and surgery in particular, one who held in high regard the uh, scientific method and scientific research, why would he believe a declaration like this? That he knows his Redeemer lives and that that Redeemer stood upon this earth and that he in his flesh, Bob, with his own eyes, will see God. Bob's obituary, obituary gives a clue, which Liz already referred to, and I felt led to say a few things about that as I uh, begin. Uh, I quote that Bob is a transcendent rejecting materialism, which holds that the universe is all there ever was and all there ever will be. Bob was a deep thinker. And last June, we sat in the shade beside his swimming pool, and among other things that we talked about, we had a very honest conversation about life and death and what comes next. Does anything come next? Can we be sure? Have we lived our lives, we sort of said to each other, in the correct direction? Or has that been for naught? I reminded Bob that day of what I had said at his mother's graveside, that when we die, all we have in that moment is a promise. And so we talked about that reality. Either you die in a promise or you die in nothingness. We are not like the ancient Egyptians who stuffed their pyramids 
and their hidden tombs with their favorite and most valuable possessions. As Americans, we can live like that and stuff our houses and our garages, uh, but we don't die like that. We've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul in tow. Even the atheist knows you can't take it with you. You can't take the car, you can't take the portfolio, the house, you can't take your phone, in case you didn't know, horrors, there will be no phones, praise God. You can't take the people that you love and care for. When we die, we either cling to a promise in faith, or we have nothing. Bob and I both laughed out loud that day, and it was a laughter of humility. Uh, I said to him, you know, Bob, either we are right, or we will never know that we're wrong. Either we're right, or we will never know that we're wrong. We'll never know what fools we have been, if that's the case. Either there's a next conscious moment we were saying to each other after we die, and so the gospel is true, or there's nothing. You're gone. You are gone forever. Some Eastern religions maintain the non-material consciousness that we are sort of absorbed into the great consciousness of the universe at death. But even there, you'll still never know that because your individual consciousness is gone. It's not even important. That's because you're not important. But the historic Christian faith is unique amongst all religions claiming the promise of resurrection, that creation and the material world do matter, and that Jesus' resurrection is proof of that and is a down payment that guarantees ours, which is to say that Christianity is unique in its belief in the preservation of a person after death. Will you still be you? Will I still be me? I hope I'm a better me. Bob is a much better Bob, I believe. But he's still Bob. And if we go after the pattern of our prototype, Jesus Christ, he's still recognizable as Bob and will be. And that's because Bob was always meant to be who he was. He was meant to be who he became. His maker and his redeemer will raise him and all those he loves with imperishable bodies, that's the promise, and there will be no need of surgeons in heaven. Bob will gratefully be out of work at least the work to which he devoted himself during his earthly life. And he will stand on the new earth in his new flesh and see his God. Any honest scientist eventually hits the wall of unanswerable questions about the universe. And like the ancient Greeks, the scientist actually becomes a philosopher. I was a philosophy major. Bob was a scientist. He went to med school. I went to seminary and became a pastor. But sort of at the end of the day, our careers kind of meet in some of the things that we discuss. We all become philosophers. And we ask honest questions about our life and our purpose in our day People ask questions like this. Is the, is the planet we live on just some amazing, wonderful accident of the universe? Thank you, universe. That just happens to circle this one star, our sun, at just the right distance. 
And of all the planets and stars in the universe, ours sort of won the lottery so that human beings could exist and we could get to experience consciousness and life and have memories and passions and joys and enjoyment of each other and the accumulation of knowledge and we get to have re relationships and experience community and along with that a lot of brokenness, a lot of sadness, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. Is our solar system just an amazing giant accident hurtling through the Milky Way at what some people estimate as 448,000 miles per hour. Or, and this is the big one, and this is where Bob put his stake down, okay? Does the universe as it is, whenever it was made or how, I didn't care about the how, does it have an ultimate purpose? Is there an author? Do we have a purpose? Were you put on this earth for a purpose? Were you put on this earth in your skin to look just like you and with the personality that you have for a reason to be you? For Bob, as a scientist and as a believer, that made an incredible amount of sense. As his obituary states, it cohered with everything that he knew about the natural world, and he knew a lot, a lot more than I know, about little things and big things. Coheres with that, and it coheres with the God revealed in Scripture who came to us in Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son, and who stood on this earth, as it says in Job 19. The Christian faith makes much more sense of the physical universe as we know it. It does take faith, but it makes much more sense, and it may require more faith to disbelieve and discount the things that we've mentioned. It accounts for why we're here, who we're called to be, who we have been made to know. And for Bob, trusting Jesus and his promises was not some blind leap of faith, as some might call it, or a cop-out based on fear or weakness, as Nietzsche would say, no, he chose to trust the promises because Christianity, for him, was the most intellectually sound explanation of our world and the universe. It's a faith, historically, that stands the test of scrutiny if you bother to look at it, even if legitimate mysteries Remain. And so when Bob died on Sunday, he died in the promises. He died trusting in those promises and found himself in glory. Perhaps one of the verses that summarizes this, um, and, and it, it's a verse that I think became special between Sophia and Pop Pop or Grandpa, whatever that was. Because um, I think Bob was teaching him, te teaching Sophia that verse. And, and when I saw this, I was amazed because verse 16 is one of my favorites. First John 4, 14 to 16. And this is John speaking, an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world and if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God and lives in him, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. That's what Bob was doing. He, was, he knew and relied 
on the love that God has for him. So what are some of the promises? That's just where I'll spend my remaining remarks. And I thought I'd just list a few that are found near the end of Romans chapter 8. One promise is found in verses 31 and 32 where Paul says, what should we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who didn't spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? I mean, think about it. It's an argument from the greater to the lesser. If God did not spare his one and only, if God in essence gave himself his own life to us, if he is that generous, of course he's going to follow through on all the things that he's promised. What are the all things referred to here? People debate that. I tend to go back to the Apostles' Creed where we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. He gives us the Holy Spirit. We say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints, and he gives to us the church and the saints. So we're not alone. He grants to us the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of our bodies. In my flesh I will see God and the life everlasting. An eternal, unending existence with a God of grace who's lavished his love on us in Christ. And with an unending mercy and goodness. Will he not also give Bob all things. In the ancient Near East, kings who won great victories and defeated their enemies would bring their spoils of war home and adorn their throne rooms with chiseled murals of the great battles they had won, and they would surround themselves with all the riches and the spoils of war that they had. I was in the British, British Museum one time, and I stood in Sennacherib's throne room one of the kings that attacked Jerusalem in the Old Testament. Um, but Jesus, the king, wins the greatest victory ever in the most unusual way possible in his willing death and his resurrection from the dead so as to defeat death. And then he shares all the benefits of his life and his death with his children. We're like joint heirs. Your name's in the will. And the father's the executor of the estate. And he makes sure that all his sons and daughters receive the all things that have been promised. I don't know what heaven and earth will be like. Nobody really does, although there's a lot of books about it. All we have in scripture are some images, some metaphors about the next life. One image is of home or a house. I love that image a home of righteousness. There's also the picture of a heavenly city that comes down and it settles upon the new earth and now the dwelling of God is with man. There are pictures of banquets and wedding feasts, good food, good drink, time with each other, celebration. There's also the vision of a river flowing down the great street of the city from the throne of God and the Lamb. And along the banks of the river is the tree of life which spans both banks. It's so huge and majestic and so life-giving that it harvests fruit every month. Every month. And as if that's not enough, the scriptures say, and the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. Leaves are always, have always had medicinal properties in every culture to heal and restore. And the picture here is of every tribe and nation, every people group, the great diversity of cultures greater than you can think of or imagine. And now there is no unrest. There is no strife. All is well and at peace. 
The leaves of the tree of life have brought healing power. Whatever the new earth and the heaven is like, I can assure you of this, that it is a place. It is a place. I go to prepare a place for you, Jesus said. And if I go there, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. We are people of place. And I think we are because God, we are made in his image. And so we are people of place because God is a God of a place. He has a place. Well, I've had places, the shores of Lake Michigan, walking the beach. He loved music, rich music, hymns that said something. He's in a, pl in a place of indescribable beauty and music and harmony, unparalleled worship. No good thing has been withheld. He graciously gives us all things. This passage also says that, and you may wonder why it says it, it, it says that no charges can ever be brought against us. No condemnation will ever occur. Who will bring in a charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life. He's at the right hand of God, and he's interceding for us. You know, everybody has baggage. Okay? We all have baggage. If we took all our failures and faults, all our sins and guilt, against God or others, and we assumed that each Sin and failure took up one cubic foot. How much baggage would you and I be walking around with? A lot more than we could carry. Way more than one of those carts at the airport you rent could handle. We'd need a, I would need a convoy of trucks and my own landfill to deal with my baggage if it actually took up space. Well, I would be the first to admit he had baggage. He could look back at his life, and he did that a lot in this past year, and readily admit he wasn't always the husband that he needed to be to Diane, or the father he felt he should have been to, to Liz and RJ. He was aware of imperfections and shortcomings even in the midst of the unceasing pressure and competition for time and energy that being a surgeon of his skill level involved. So how was he able to move forward in his life and live in peace? How was Bob, over the past few months and weeks, able to die in peace? I think it's this. He knew that Jesus of Nazareth sent by God, had taken all his baggage upon himself. And as he, Jesus, was nailed to the cross, so was Bob's baggage nailed with him. Nailed to the cross. And as he was nailed, he bore it there. Stuart Town and song, it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. That's why that psalmist cries out, if you, O oh Lord, kept a record of sins, oh, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness. Bob knew why his Savior was hanging on a cross. It was to save him. Bob knew that every single charge that could be levied against him that would most certainly result in a guilty verdict was graciously borne by someone else. His loving savior, a substitute, the one who knew no sin, became sin for us. And he did that so that anyone who believes could be justified instead of being condemned. And if anyone ever raises an objection, and usually that's the evil one, Jesus is there to intercede on our behalf. We have the Lord on retainer, so to speak. 
always there. A few minutes, we're going to sing the hymn, Rock of Ages, and the second and third verse say this so well. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could, could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Last promise we see here is if God is for us, there's never going to be any separation from his love for us. It won't end. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he lists all these things that we think would normally separate us from people. And he lists all those things like famine and death or demons or angels or um, being a refugee and not having a home. Any, any of those things. None of those things that we would think of can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. The entire story of the scripture can be summarized in this one promise that those who cling to Jesus, and it's for those who cling to Jesus in faith, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's what Paul's saying here. There's no separation. My name, Emmanuel, means God with us, and that promise has been proven. And that promise comes to fruition as we go to be with him, even as he's been with us while we live our lives here. And so we know and we rely on the love God has for us. I'm a big Lord of the Rings guy. No apologies. A lot of times scientists don't like literature like that. But that's okay. But there's a tearful moment at the end of the Fellowship of the Ring, when Frodo breaks the fellowship, he's convinced he needs to carry this ring all by himself to Mordor because the ring, is, it's just too evil. It's too powerful. And so he takes his boat and starts to row across the river to the land of shadow, and his faithful friend Samwise catches Frodo in the act, and he splashes into the water, shouting after Mr. Frodo, wading too deep into the river, half drowns until Frodo finally reaches over the side of the boat, pulls him out, and Samwise, who had committed himself to go with Frodo the whole journey, says, a promise is a promise, Mr. Frodo. I made a promise. Don't you leave him, Samwise, Gamgee. And I don't mean to. Jesus says to you, I will not leave you. I have committed myself to your journey. You will never be alone, even if you die. Nothing can separate you from my love. Part of the journey of our life is death. It's built into every one of our journeys. But the psalmist says, even though I walk, even if my journey takes me through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Amen. Our service will come to a close uh, with this hymn, Rock of Ages. Many of you may be used to the older tune, as Bob wrote about uh, in the program, but one that he knows, and I know, uh, James Ward, uh, wrote a new tune to this and brought this uh, very much alive. So we encourage you to listen to it. You can sing behind your mask. We won't, we won't be checking, but you're invited to worship with this hymn.
That last verse was Bob words, Bob's words to you. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you for the gift of life. We all take our lives for granted. It's every day is a gift. We thank you for the life that you gave to Bob that's touched so many of us and touched just countless people in this entire region, people living today because of the healing skills that you gave to him. We thank you for the hope that frames our grief, that even though we die in Christ, we can live. Send your comfort, the comfort that can only come from Christ upon this family, these dear ones Bob loved so much. Be near them in this time of loss. Grant them peace. And now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.